Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 458, featuring a, an exclusive interview with none other than Brian Fargo and David Rogers of In Exile. And as you imagine, in this uh, interview we talk about, of course, Wasteland 3, a game that, in my opinion, is probably the best role-playing game we've seen at least since Fallout New Vegas, and maybe beyond that. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it, and I wanted to get these guys on to uh, talk about it. But we also talk about some other stuff. We get into VR, the future of that, what that looks like from uh, their perspective. We get into The Bard's Tale, uh, what's the future of that series, what went well and what didn't go well with the development of that. Uh, we talk about RPG mechanics, uh, making choices, uh, and then Brian gets into a, a bunch of questions uh, basically sent in by Matt Chatters. Uh, those cover all sorts of topics. Some pretty, uh, some pretty fun stuff, some pretty cool stuff. We have some fun. Anyway, there's a whole lot here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Brian Fargo and Mr. David Rogers. Hello, folks. I am here with none other than Brian Fargo, the studio head of In Exile Entertainment, and David Rogers, the creative director, toaster repair experts. You know, I feel like that's probably what we'll be talking about most of this, this chat, the nuances of effective toaster repair. Uh, I think anybody looking around the world today will realize the value of a good toaster and why this is something you should be pursuing now. Uh, but seriously, though, what is the story behind these toasters in Wasteland? I think the real question is why more games don't have toaster repair. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's like lockpick and mechanics. I mean, I don't understand it. Where else do you get toast? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you play Fallout. Where are you getting your toast from? Nowhere. That's where. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you know, we, 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 so, you know, I mean, a lot of people know we, um, we were looking to go to a skill-based system because we wanted to simulate real t things that were happening in contemporary life, which is why we went with the mercenary spies and private eyes system uh, to set us up for Wasteland. And so as we were going through, uh, which ones do we want, you know, so the, we went with a lot of the practical ones, but, you know, we, we always have a strange sense of humor. So in one of those conversations, and I don't remember which one, uh, you know, we started talking about the need for good toast and, and having toasters were being uh, working. And, and then, of course, it got to the, wouldn't it be funny if things started popping out of toasters like a, like a chest? And, and so it stuck. And it became one of those quirky little things that we've uh, leaned into over and over again. And, uh, and I, think, I think our strange sense of humor is even more, uh, well, it's gotten even stranger, <laughs> I think, since then. I think that's what else makes these games so memorable. I mean, you're always waiting for this. I, I just was wondering if maybe somewhere in the distant past, maybe you stuck your hand in a toaster or something and like a running bit game. Bit by a radioactive toaster. Bit by a radioactive toaster. <laughs> I, I should, I should, well, you know, I should probably make up a funny story, but you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can say that I, I wouldn't doubt that there is a, more to it because if there's anything, no, that, anybody that's worked at a development company before is the kitchens are a mess. I mean, at all times. And so I'm, I'm sure we had dirty and broken toasters that I, I can almost guarantee that happened. So people were putting things in the toasters that broke the toasters. thus necessitating the need for toaster repair. It's yeah, all starting to make sense. Our toasters at the office are just clogged up with Tarzan tokens. Can't, <laughs> can't do anything with them. Yeah. I thought it was pretty cool how, you know, there's a gameplay element to it. You know, it, you, there's a combat benefit, basically, even for the toast to repair. I, I was really pleased with the Tarzan tokens in particular yeah. because it very much felt like, and this is one of my favorite things about finding loot, is when finding a gun is cool, 
but I kind of like it when you loot a quest. You know what I mean? You loot something mysterious, like mm. a note, and you go like, oh, I can tell this is going to kick off something bigger. Um, those to me are like the most rewarding because you get all the anticipation of like, where do I turn this in? And then you get the, like the kind of the endorphin rush of finding mm. the, you know, the Tarjan machine. And th those, those I think is where it works, works best. And then when you get like, and then you go through all the rigmarole and then you come out with like a permanent perk, like, you know, uh, precognition best. or something like it really does help like give the story. I got toast repair and then it kicks off a story that has like a beginning, middle and end. And, and it's something you want to like share with your friends and it sticks with you. Yeah. I remember getting a, like a piece of a golden toast or like a, a cord or something. I'm like, what the heck is this? This is, should I sell it? No, I probably shouldn't sell it. I got a feeling. <laughs> it, it's uh, without, without giving away the spoiler. Did you ever figure oh. out what to do with those? I never did. And I'm, oh. I'm, that gives oh. me a reason to want to go back and play it again. It, there's a thing to do with those. <laughs> there, there, there's a payoff. It's I was resisting the urge to look at a walkthrough. You know, I just wanted to find out on my own. It's especially funny seeing people playing Wasteland 3 who have never played the other series. So they're going in completely straight-faced, and then they see Toaster Repair, and it's just, it's so random. Right. I, I think our character creation does a good job of, like, kind of giving up the game a little bit because it's Toaster Repair and Mime and yeah. Goat Killer and... Yeah. Yeah, you should know what you're getting into at that point. Right. Well, you know, I think the game does a good job... It's humorous, but it's, it never feels like it's descending into like just outright comedy. You know, it feels, it, it, may, it, it holds on to like a certain grittiness, which I, I don't know how you guys do it, man. I mean, <laughs> I, I imagine, now you're, you're probably a, a, a paper and pencil role player yourself, I would imagine. I dabble. I dabble, I bet you do. It, it, it very much, the tone of Wasteland very much reminds me, and this is why I find it so, I love it so much is it very much feels like a dungeon master or like, sorry, uh, like a, like a D and D game you're playing with your friends. The dungeon master wrote a very serious plot and there's real stakes and there's a wizard and like the world's going to, but you're with your friends. So you can't help but goof off a little bit. You can't help but crack jokes. You can't help but have fun and like keep it lighthearted because you're hanging out with your friends. Like that, that to me is like the, the way I kind of think about the wasteland tone. Yeah, but humor is always scary to put in any form. Like, no matter what, I mean, with any joke and any comedian, there's somebody that thinks that it's hilarious and another person that thinks it's juvenile. And so that's just, you know, it's inescapable in that way. Um, but it is, I mean, the world's pretty harsh, you know, and it's pretty bleak and it's rough and it's mature. And so when the, when the, when the funny parts come in, they're, they're, they're funnier uh, to us. But, but it is difficult, and I've always said that Humor in any way is an extra risk because you're already being held up to, in a bunch of different categories. You know, you know, how's the gameplay? How the visuals? How's the sound? You know, you know what? There, there's a number of factors people will determine when they write a review or tell someone whether they should play a game. The minute you put humor in a game, you've now created a new category for people to criticize, and so they get to say, well, you know great game but you know i didn't think it was funny or great game and i found it hilarious whatever the whatever the situation is but you know that's entertainment that's okay we, we do things that make us laugh that we think are thoroughly enjoyable and we hope that we find an audience that has our taste and that's all we can do yeah, i guess ultimately it is subjective what somebody finds funny i, I thought all the jokes i mean i was laughing <laughs> you know yeah it's kind of a bittersweet thing uh, we could get uh, before oh, we're going to talk more about Wasteland Three, but I wanted to, to talk a little bit too about the Frostpoint uh, VR proving grounds. You know, I had some questions from the uh, about this. Alan had uh, had asked, "What do you think about Half Life, Alex?" And they wanted he wanted to know what was your uh, life changing experience with VR. You know, a lot of people talk about you know the first time they really got VR. Yeah. So I thought I, I thought that was a good question. Wanted to ask you guys well i think i think for me you know oculus used to be in irvine so they were they were right up the street and so they had me over for some demos and i think the aha moment for me there was a demo where i was in like a museum or something and this dinosaur this like t-rex comes around the corner and then he looks at me and then he just comes 
running down the corridor right at me and, you know, his body's going right over my head. That was like a holy shit. I love this, right? I mean, it was, it was like my little primal brain was going, is this real? Is this not real? You know, it was like, I could tell it was like tapping into different kinds of things. And so I think that was my aha. I, I really love this medium. Uh, and then I started, I played, boy, uh, w once the Oculus came out, I, I was playing everything that came out. I was playing it on the, on the portable phone unit. There was some weird thing where I was like strapped. There was one game where I was any big game. I was strapped into a wheelchair in an insane asylum. And I was being pushed through this R-rated insane asylum. I don't remember the name of it. I mean, was that people, Wilson's heart? No, 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 no. It was real video. It was like real people, you know? Oh, like, uh, I, I think I know what you're talking about. crazy, yeah. like, naked guy. And then there was a bunch of people, like, dancing around me, doing Ring Around the Rosie, and their, their faces were like, coming in real close. And I used, to do, I used to put that on people's faces at my house and go, try to see if you can sit through it. And it was like most people could not make it all the way to the very end. And I went, oh, this is such a great medium. So it was things like that. And, you know, I mean, Arizona Sunshine was amongst the most – fun I've, I've had playing a game in years it took me back to the the giddy nature of when i got my apple ii i was just wow like a kid again so there was there were several different points for me that that why i i gravitated uh towards it i don't know david you want to yeah yeah. Uh, yeah i have i have a couple i was uh, <laughs> just trying not to stomp if there's another question um yeah i i i think the thing that one of the most memorable, and it's super simple, but it was kind of the one of the first really transformative experiences I had, is we started, we like, you know, I actually didn't get into VR until the company got into VR, and then I was like, oh, I should check this out. And I spent, like, literally days on end in VR. Like, I would come into work, throw on a headset, be there for nine hours, jack out, <laughs> go home, and I was really trying to consume everything I could. And what I found was that it was the Valve... Uh, demo like the, the demo suite that Valve put out mm -hmm. um, and specifically the archery one I remember like just kind of holding my arm out and reaching behind me and like the arrow popped and like like the the, the tumbler on the on the controller like rotated once for like a little click and I was like oh I grabbed it and then I like knock the bow and I pull it back and my controller's vibrating and I just like I I you know I'm, I when I was growing up I was a kid kid who would play pretend I would grab any old stick and pretend it was a sword and I'd terrorize the neighborhood and it really took me back like just the act of like performing actions and how like visceral like there there's this concept of uh, like Jane McGonigal gives these talks on power poses like literal postures you can take that kind of have physiological effects and help mm -hmm. set your mindset and I would like pull out that arrow and I was like oh I feel powerful like like just doing that all by itself just gives you this really good rush and the way that incorporates your body like really was like transformative for me. Um, and then similarly, there was a skydiving demo that was nauseating, but I was like, oh my God, this stuff is so powerful. Like I could make a game where you eat a mushroom and then I could actually make you throw up. Like you can do so much <laughs> if you want to do. There's so much power here that we never, I, I would never do that, but like the power is intoxicating. <laughs> yeah, you guys are making me really want to try the Oculus. And, you know, you, you did the, I guess, Mage's Tale, mm -hmm. I guess that was about 2017 or so. and Yeah, they're, they're about. On this yeah. frost point. Uh, you know, where do you think that the technology is going? Do you, you think it's sort of got a lot of room to grow or it's just sort of in its infancy? You know, where do you place the whole VR gaming space? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty it's it well yes it's got a long ways to go and i think yes it's it's and it's an infancy uh you know the the you look at how far that you know the new quest 2 has come along since uh you know it, it's it's almost you know as we're getting up to the beating of as powerful as the quest one running on a computer uh and and and, a, and basically what is a a mobile version of it um i think that I think it starts getting really interesting when AR and VR are completely mm -hmm. combined. Um, if you think, if I could just walk around with AR glasses all day and have everything overlay and then have it just hit a thing and have them go black and now I'm in VR, right? Now I'm just, I'm really the same thing. I think, I think when you combine those two together seamlessly, that to me is when it just takes off. And uh, it's always interesting. Uh, VR, for the, you know, a lot of people love it and a lot of people kind of poo-poo it. 
but you know, for the people that love it, it's because it, it's, it's, I'm telling you, I've just had great experiences and yeah, it's not, it's, it's harder, you know, for people to get into, you, you know, I got to do all this extra stuff to do it. Um, but gosh, as a medium, it's so interesting. I mean, you know, you, you, you're looking into the room of what the person's doing. So as far as like the variables and the palette that, 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 that people that you could use now, you know, it, it's like, okay, now it's uh, it, one sense of scale is completely different in VR versus it is on a 2D screen. Sound is completely different. I mean, we can put things right behind you in a very different kind of way. We can, I mean, you can give people heart attacks in VR uh, with, with audio and surround And then you start thinking, well, where are they looking? Where are their hands? Where are their palms? Where are their digits? So you're looking at the person and those are all variables that never existed before on just a 2D screen. So I think there's a lot more that can be done that hasn't been done in terms of using those variables. I feel like it's just warming up. I and mean, look, look at all the, the way that computer games evolve over the last decade or two decades. And VR will have the same kind of evolution. And, and in terms of like, I, I'm, I'm very, the AR angle obviously is like very cool. Um, I, I think it's kind of clear that you find people like they'll get into VR and they'll get on a roller coaster and they will have an involuntary reaction. They are actually afraid. Like you're like, we're, we're, we found a, like a storytelling medium where, where we're actually able to trick your brain into thinking the reality we're projecting is real. Like you will have physiological reactions, you will sweat, you will panic, you will get, you know, your heart rate will rise. And we haven't even like made you exercise just because you hear, heard a scary sound. So it seems kind of like there, there's, I feel like the, the jury's in that this is the most immersive medium. And now like the big challenge is, can we make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where playing VR is about as easy as it is to turn on my TV. Like if, if we can, if we can make, you know, playing VR about that easy, then now we've unlocked this massive potential, you know, for, for storytelling that, that is, is unrivaled, but it's just kind of a hassle to turn on. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think of it, what was that? Was it Resident Evil 7 or what was the last Resident Evil? The one where they were all sitting around the kitchen table and had that, that fantastic scene. But, you know, they did a V, I played that game, loved it. And they said there was a VR version, and I said, "No friggin' way! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not playing it." Like, like I like made the calculation that I was not gonna put my, I'm not gonna endure myself. It was scary enough with people busting through walls and doing all this crazy stuff that the idea of VR was too much. It makes you wonder if people should sign a waiver or something. You know, like, <laughs> and this is like the a whole new level of uh, vis viscerality, I guess. Wow. And, and you, I think if you go to places like the zone or whatever, we, like back when those were functioning, but those like immersive theme parks, you kind of saw exactly that. Like, Hey, this is really intense. You know, you need to know what you're getting into. If you have a heart attack, it's not our fault. You mean, do you mean back in the day when we could go outside, David? Yeah. And people, back and when people, places <laughs> and people would wear a headset that somebody else had just worn. You mean the back in those days? Yeah. Yeah. In the before times that. in the long ago. Yeah, I saw a documentary. <laughs> yeah, it was in black and white. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell my kids about it, yeah. <laughs> well, they, David, I was looking at your portfolio. And you got it's a weird one, huh? Interesting stuff on there. We definitely want to touch on some of this, these topics. So you worked on the some sure. of the America's Army stuff. Yeah, Which America's work? Army Proving Grounds. Proving Grounds. Uh, so something called the Experiential Learning Center. Which was a suite of educational games. Yes, yeah, so, um, so all of that was working at the Army Game Studio. So there was a period of time where I was um, a game programmer and then a game designer for the United States Army. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was my first, that was me cutting my teeth, you know. I, I think general advice to anybody getting in the industry is step one, get experience. Mm -hmm. And then step two, do what you want. And, and so that was definitely me going like, oh, I have a chance to make cool video game type things, uh, you know, with real, you know, professionals. Let's do it. Um, and yeah, and so all of those were, now I can't, it's kind of weird working for the army. I can't really talk too deeply about any of the projects I'm on because all of them kind of dip through various levels of protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, but basically I, I built a bunch of tutorials, uh, for, for the army, uh, you know, cause that's kind of what, uh, it was a bunch of training software, simulators and things and America's army, the entertainment product. 
Um, but everything that wasn't that was some kind of simulator teaching you to do some procedure, teaching you to escape some hazardous situation, teaching you to, and then there was one where I was teaching kids about like STEM subjects like math and science and engineering. And it was sponsored by the army, but not really army related. It was for like a museum exhibit. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. Yeah, you know, I, I would add one thing, you know, when I first started Interplay, uh, we did some military work for Laurel. I mean, that's oh, what, really? yeah, we did for, for Laurel G, uh, systems up in Long Beach. And we, we were just, it was for, they wanted to take a computer out in the field and track uh, enemy movement or something like that. And, but that, that I remember that I, I, we were busy doing that and that gave me time, to David's point, to go do the things I wanted to do. That was enough to pay the bills so that I could start going out and pitching Bard's Tale and some of mm -hmm. the things that we did. So, there, you know, I think we all have things. I think most people start in life with what you have to do and then what you want to do. They don't normally start the same. And so, you know, <laughs> we all have our journey. Yeah, a lot of us are still in that, trying to get to that point where you can do what you want to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got to eat a lot of vegetables. Some, I think some people want to do yeah. what, you, what you like. <laughs> what, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's get into uh, Wasteland 3 then, or I mean, we've already gotten into it, but let's, let's go circle back to it. I just uh, really wanted to congratulate both of you on the game. Oh, thank you. I just was looking at some of these awards. I mean, it's incredible, uh, the the reviews and, and all that. I don't normally put a lot of stock in that. I prefer to play it myself and <laughs> get my take on it. But yeah, I completely uh, knocked it out of the box. And, you know, I did do a video where I was showing this collector's edition so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the, sort of how this all came together. I mean, we got the, even the box itself, I don't oh. know how you can see this, but it's a, even the styrofoam, it's like branded. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that before. And then like this, this really cool, uh, I mean, it's all theme appropriate stuff. Yeah. Like the I mean, tapes and our, our heavy UBS duty. Stuff. I mean, this is just the most, this, wow. Yeah, I've, well, we, I've never seen a cooler collector's edition. Oh, no way. No, we, we, we went all out on that. Um, part of it is definitely courtesy Microsoft. You know, we, we, they're like, you know, if you had extra budget money to spend, what would be one of the things? And I was like, well, you know, for our backers that came in and supported us all these years, I'd love to get them something really awesome. And so we, we went for it on that. And we, you know, it was kind of the sky's the limit. So... Uh, and it came out great. I think the Scorpatron came out great. Scorpatron. The, the wow. cassette that you showed that has a little UBS with the, some of the music uh, from the game. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was, you know, and, and, you know, who, I don't know that we'll do collector's editions again. That could be the, the hmm. I don't know. What? I, mean, we'll, <laughs> the, I, I don't know, right? I, I'm, that's my assumption. Uh, hmm. It might be that there could be, but, but everything's going digital and collector's editions are, are sort of the abnormal thing. And so... It could, it could be our last one. So let, let's go out with a really great one. Yes, you got the reliquary from Bardstill behind you there. I got those as well. That, you know, that, I, I that, love that. The, that those, those are all handmade, those boxes. Oh, it's amazing. I was, the question here is about which one of the, uh, or what's your favorite bit? I guess, what's your favorite pack-in from this collector's edition? I'm, well, it has to be the Scorpatron. I don't know. I mean, that, right. I mean it's yeah, too I'm, awesome. <laughs> sometimes I come down and see that thing. I can like jump a little bit. Oh, man, I hope it doesn't <laughs> try to sting me or something. Yeah. I, I, I'm a sucker for miniatures myself, so I can't, I can't get enough of that little guy. Is that just a – I guess you probably hired a, some sort of modeler to make that, or I, who, I, made the, who made the mini? Um, I don't know. Sabine handled all that stuff. I, don't, I think I don't, the model was made in house, wasn't it? Yeah. Like the I model remember. itself. The model itself. Like perhaps. the 3D model. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah. and then they were, and then they were 3D printed by someone with like a really nice, like high resolution 3D printer. Cause that's why, like, it doesn't really look like a, your classic 3D printed object because it looks so clean. Yeah, it doesn't I never have all those little. It. It was, it was right. it's, the, it's the high end of what you could do in that, I think, in, with that. I mean, you could but take yeah, a no, magnifying I, glass to that thing and find little details. Yeah, no, it's yeah. great. It, it was fun to see people unpack it, too, and, and uh, 
and watch them. So and I, I saw you did it and the, some other streamers did it. So it was cool. I mean, I, th I think for the team at large too, like watching people kind of, that was really something that kind of got us amped as we were going towards release. Obviously releasing a game is really hard. It takes a lot of work. There's a lot of stress involved. And so a couple of days, like a, it was like a week or two before the game started coming out, we were seeing like YouTube videos. And I would, I would search YouTube for just the most recent, not the most viewed, not the most popular, just most recent. And then search Wasteland 3. And I would see people with, you know, like just fans opening this thing up and getting so excited for our game. They have like five views, but they're like so enthusiastic and so genuine. And that's something that like really, I, we would share those on our teams and on our like chat uh, system and like pass those around and kind of all get really excited watching people like get amped for like, oh man, I can't wait. Oh, the music's so good. Like, I thought even the way the stuff was packed into the box is, is almost like you were thinking about those videos because you don't start like right away with the Scorpatron. You know, you got to work your way down to that. The slow reveal. <laughs> it just was really That well. was artful. Yeah, it was just the whole thing. Just, you know, marvelous. So definitely deserve uh, full kudos. Uh, let's see. I have a question here from Richard Simmons. I don't know if this is the Richard Simmons or not, but maybe we can. Maybe it is. Who knows? Let's just pretend. We'll just, we'll just assume it is. <laughs> yeah. No one lies on the internet. <laughs> Big Wasteland fan, you know. Uh, serious question, though. Uh, how did COVID and, and the remote work impact Wasteland 3? Have there been any benefits uh, to people working remotely? Do you guys think the industry will still, still embrace remote work once we go back to working in an office? Uh, well... Uh, let's see. Um, well, it did affect it. I mean, it, it, it was rather abruptly as, as you know, I, I was keeping a close eye and I, I want to say, I saw the first reports in late January. I read something some scientists put together and I'd sent it out and said, this looks like this is like serious stuff. And then it was like, I think on like a March 11th, I said, hey, we're closing again. March 12th, we were closed. I mean, it was very, very quick. It was something along those lines. I know it was March 12th. Um, so, you know, right away, everybody had to go. They'd take their stuff. So there was a fair amount of disruption uh, because, you know, we partly we were used to working remotely because we have an office in New Orleans. And so ironically, when we used to... Uh, uh, check in our assets. We do it through New Orleans. So we were sort of used to that. Um, but, you know, technologically, we, we did have to change some things eventually to make it so we could do things faster. Um, and we had to, again, everybody got, it was very, fairly disruptive for a while. And so it was also part where, okay, this is going to throw us off our schedule and we don't have to make the year end. So we, you know, we said to Microsoft, look, we're, we can't hit the same date. And they were like, that's cool. Totally understandable. And as long as we're spending, sure I understand. oops, my, my watch is talking. <laughs> my watch doesn't understand um, <laughs> the, that. Hey, what, what, we'd like to take a little bit more time because we don't know how things are going to play out and, and no developer doesn't want more time. Um, so as far as benefit and detriment uh, benefit, my dog is happy, loves me being at home, sits at my feet all the time. I mean, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, I mean, David will have a different perspective, but, but, you know, I think the negative is that there's a lot that comes out of working together in an office. There's a kind of a humanity to it. Most of our conversations when we're online are about the, the problem or the product or whatever it is. Whereas when you're in office, you'd have different conversations about, your family or what's going on or just whatever random film that's out, you know, there's just other parts mm -hmm. going on. And there's also uh, where uh, j j there are things that you hear something in the hall and you go, Hey, wait, what do you, what's going on there? Or, or I could just be looking over somebody's computer screen and going, that looks fantastic. What did you do there? Let's do more of that. You know, that looks really great. And you, you miss all of that stuff. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of intangibles. Um, and so, um, I, I think we, I think we're doing a great job dealing with it. You know, not, not, we're not complaining about it. You know, we, we had to finalize a very complex game with Wasteland 3, all from our homes. That's about as difficult as it gets. And I, I think the hardest part is like, okay, we're all going to make this sprint. We're all going to go for it. All right, let's charge that hill. And then you go click, and then you're sitting all by yourself, you and your cat. 
you know, there, there, there's not the, let's all go do this together. I mean, there is, but there isn't. So I think mm -hmm. you lose some energy from all that. So I guess that's kind of my, my summary, yeah. I guess, of the pluses and minuses. And, and I think, I think in, even in when you reference Wasteland 3, like if it had to, if I had to pick when a global pandemic would wreak havoc across the globe, um, like in terms of like what's most advantageous for us, this is probably the best time. Cause like, like Brian was saying, like those creative, like that creative synergy you get from just kind of being around other people, having those dumb conversations. Like a lot of the humor comes out of you, like the developers hanging out and like, oh man, this would be so dumb if we did this. Oh, we should totally do that. Like it's that kind of like, kind of excitement, the infectious excitement that makes the game so fun. But a lot of that was already done by the time COVID rolled around. And we were very much in a mode of like, the game is done, but we need to polish it balance it, bug fix. We need to go do some full run. Like we were really like buttoning things up. So, so like at very least it was, it was kind of nicely lined up in that way is as good as it possibly could have been, I suppose. Um, whereas like, I feel like start starting a project under COVID circumstances is like a much bigger, like creative challenge to overcome you know, getting people excited, getting people enthused, getting that vision kind of permeating through the team is harder to do when you have to call them up individually or send them text messages as opposed to just like being excited in person. So. I guess the timing worked out. All right, so before we get into the uh, nitty gritty of the game's combat, I thought we might talk a little bit about the story and some of the themes of the game. I was kind of reminding, some places kind of reminded me a little bit of Bioshock Infinite uh, the sort of Americana themes going through there, of course, the earlier uh, wastelands. I just think it must have been tough coming up with a story in this political climate, you know, that we're in, uh, that would uh, appeal to gamers on all sides of the fence. And a grumpy tentacle had written in and put it this way, uh, how much freedom do you have regarding the creativity? He says he misses good, well-written, old-school CRPGs where you didn't have to worry about what the internet will say. <laughs> so what, are your, what are your thoughts on all, on all this? Well, there's, there's a few things to unpack on, mm -hmm. that, on that question. Um, I think the strangest thing was that we, I mean, we started the writing a long time ago. And so we, st we wrote for a, a fictional post-apocalyptic world. And the real world started catching up with, with, with things that we were doing. And I mean, it, to the point where we had lines that we removed from the game because I was afraid people would thinking we were putting things in to capitalize on the environment as opposed to avoid it. I mean, for an example, there were lines in there where what are you gonna wanna do next? Defund the marshals? literally said to fund wow. the marshals. And I said, you know, that there, no one's going to believe us that that was written two years ago. Uh, you know, we, we had marshals that were beating up refugees. Uh, and so there were things that we thought this is not for those reasons. Um, it's not, it's not necessary or needed to keep it, but by and large, we didn't really care. I mean, for me, we we're setting out like we, we look at history and we look at other countries and we look at the effects of the war that it's had wars have had on people or plagues or any number of different sort of events and we said what happens in those worlds well you get warlords you get refugees you get sickness and you get sometimes you get the worst of mankind and sometimes you get the best but we looked for those things and we and we wrote for that and we let the chips fall where they may and, and so we, I mean, I, I think that anybody who plays the product will see, we didn't pull a lot of punches. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's mature at times. And I think it was probably one of the biggest risks that there was involved. And so, yeah, there were Americana themes because we, had, we imagined that sort of like the doomsday preppers today, well, they were right. <laughs> the bombs did fall. And they're the guys that got in charge of Colorado. And so, you know, it, it was anything from the, you know, the patriotism that, that and that's why we brought in the, the patriotic music or old biblical hymns. And then it was also uh, pop music, which was, you know, the whole idea is that 
technology kept going, but pop culture stopped. So any old song like WKRP in Cincinnati was like, you know, it was like magic to them because more, the, there weren't more sitcoms coming. So whatever was back, that was all there ever was. So that's why they would do a remake and thought it would think it was totally awesome where, where, you know, somebody else might think it's funny, but it's not to them, right? It's like you're taking it as a serious thing. So we, we had total creativity to do what we want and we really didn't pull any punches other than we not decided to change a few things so that we didn't look like we were trying to uh, take advantage of the climate. And I think the, the nature of the kind of games we make this, you know, Wasteland 3 being, you know, one of the more reactive RPGs you're going to find out there. Like we really do put the player in a position where I don't feel like the world really casts judgment on any given character. Like, you know, you talk to, if you go to, you know, Denver and you're dealing with the Gippers, the Gippers aren't casting judgment on themselves. No, there's no, the only outsider to cast judgment is the player. And so we really do leave it up to the player to make that decision. And I also think we do a pretty good job of kind of presenting these things, um, I think like fairly, like, you know, sometimes like the, the Gippers are, are mad men, but you know, they're keeping the lights running, you know, the there's people who have good things and bad things to say about them. There's followers who like what's going on. They want you to join them. And so I, I feel like by making a game that's reactive, you can really just set up the scenario and let the player be the one that casts the moral judgment. And I think that's what we find. And there's plenty of scenarios. I will watch streamers play scenarios and they, the, the moral justifications they have for those actions are all over the place because they have their own headcanon. They have their own morals and their own moral code that they're judging everything by. Um, and, and so, like, two players can do the same action, but be justifying it to themselves totally differently, which I find, I, that's like one of the coolest parts about it, is the amount that the players put into the game. And for me, that's the best part of role-playing games, too. But that, to me, that's the magic. It's almost like this ongoing socio sociology experiment that's out, you know, thanks well, to this. Well, it, it is, as, uh, why did David use the phrase, like, you know, we're, 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 we're one big trolley car experiment, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah we're just constantly asking do the means justify the ends and and that's a really hard question to answer is the life of 10 people worth the life of 100 i mean yeah. there's a lot of circumstances involved aren't there like there's a lot of uh, and there's yeah. like seven different kinds of ethics that would all answer that differently and sometimes when you pull the trolley switch it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> and you just killed 110 people <laughs> yeah for no reason <laughs> <laughs> well that takes me to this this next question i mean i was i mean there's a lot of great characters in this some great dialogues a lot of the inside jokes and you know even the, you know I, I i read the description of everything <laughs> just looking for those little inside jokes but uh but a lot of people though you know i was looking at the reviews and there's a lot of emphasis on the choices that you get to make in this game and it's not just superficial shallow stuff but i mean you really have mm -hmm. to you really have to sweat some of these choices you know, the one that stood out for me was the with the around the machine commune and the machine AIs and the, we're talking about the Gippers, you know, the, that whole scenario. Mm -hmm. So that really, like, I, I spent a lot of time just thinking about what do, what do I want to do here, you know? I was just thinking, uh, I don't want to get into spoilers territory here, but I was curious what you felt were the, the dilemmas that you're most proud of or the setups like, or situations that you put mm -hmm. players in that you're most uh, proud of. Well, I think it's it's awesome that you're thinking about the game after you played it, mm -hmm. which is great. I think that's kind of the ultimate compliment a game can do, that you're actually still thinking about it after after you're done. Um, but without giving spoilers, I, I think have you finished the game yet? Yes, I finished. Okay, so you I think it's a whole... spoiler alert if you want to just spoil it. That's <laughs> well, no, I, I think I could answer without doing it, which, which is the whole making the decision about who you're going to back at the end. Oh yeah, uh, is a tough decision, and 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 there's a lot of different endings, and people really, and I see people arguing online about being altruistic or the value of authoritarianship, and 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 people wrestle and argue about that, which I like. Uh, there's actually an optimal ending that is, doesn't require either one of those two things, but it's very hard to do. Uh, and that takes extra force. So I like that. Um, so, and, and there's a great, I think one of my favorite moments is as you get towards the end and you've made your decision, when your companions turn to you 
and say, okay, you know, uh, here's what we think about what you've just done. And, and here's who, you know, here, here's what we're going to do about that. And that's like, a, oh, shit, you know, in your face uh, for decisions that you've made. So I, I love that whole moment. Uh, and, then, and then other smaller things where I like where we, I think like Flab, the, uh, the inhaler is like this super likable guy. I think he's fantastic. And people wrestle with, you know, they, like they'll kill him and take out the bazaar. And then I'll watch them uh, 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 do the end credits, you know, streaming. And when, that, when they kill the bazaar, they're like, I feel really bad about that. Like they'll talk about how bad they felt for wiping out the bazaar since it was such a great place. And he was, and they, if, if they had known that that was going to happen, they wouldn't have done it. And, you know, I, I love the guilt that comes from that. So I guess those are a couple of moments. And I think that guilt is something you only get from like putting the, if, if we were telling a more controlled story or the player felt like they had less agency, like they wouldn't, it wouldn't have that motion. You wouldn't feel responsible mm -hmm. for their deaths. And it's really amazing how attached people get to these imaginary characters. Like the, uh, the real guilt they'll feel like the real, like, cause you get, you get into some pretty, like, you're like, oh man, should I, that armor is really good, but should I participate in slavery? Like, like the, the like mechanical advantages and the moral like dilemmas that you deal with, like really battle with you. Um, I think, yeah. I think one of the scenarios, and I kind of referenced it a second ago that I, I, I loved the most. And it's very, very early on is, is I'll watch people resolve uh, little Vegas and fair and Brigo. There's a, there's some, some gum shooing you have to do to get behind who let the Dorseys into Colorado Springs, which is like the very first encounter you run into. So I guess spoiler alert. That was not hard for, for me. 30 to minutes. It's not hard well, for me to figure out what to do there. Well, yeah, and, and, like, and, it, well, and I think the interesting, a lot of people yeah. are very sure what to do about it, but I will watch streamers, like they're justific, I, I watch multiple streamers pick the same thing, but justify it totally differently. I will have Paladin streamers I, I, I who- I was saying because of his name, but never uh, Oh. I'm oh. the same way, like it's Briga, I can't, I have to do what he says. Yeah, how can you, oh. how can you, you can't Come on. Oh Briga. yeah. I, <laughs> gotta go that, with Briga. <laughs> I, I, I think that jokes, I, I didn't even register anymore. It's blown over me so many times. I'm just immune to it. Um, but you'll, I will see players who are trying to be the good guy and they will arrest Farron Brigo. And I will see players who are the bad guy and they will arrest Brian, Brian, uh, Farron Brigo. And, and vice versa. I'll see players who are trying to do the right thing and they'll let him go. And I'll see players who are trying to do the right thing and they'll arrest him. Like, like it's such a... And so many of the problems we, we present are so gray and muddy. And it's like, it's almost straightforward, except for this one detail we introduced. And that kind of like throws everything off a little bit. Those are where it really shines. And I feel like that's where you agonize the most. And then the best part is like the impact of your choice is immediate and harsh. And it like, and, and has lasting consequences. And you return to it to kind of see what, you know, what chaos you've wrought or, or what you've kind of done to Colorado Springs. It's really a great... You know, the more I, the more I think about it, this is really venturing just into philosophical territory and people are using this to grow, you know, psychologically. I, uh, yeah, putting you in a scenario you aren't normally in. That's kind of what yeah. RPGs do really well. We're going to put you in a scenario that you, yeah. you'll never be in, you know. What is your, yeah. you, you're never going to get the chance to decide, like, the importance of AI sentience. That's really not something most of us are going to be in the driver's seat for. Except, well, maybe you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> you heard about our next I, project. I about the secret Microsoft initiatives, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's. Uh, I know we're getting a little short on time, uh, so let's uh, jump into this uh, mechanics question. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, there's been a, quite a few changes here from Wasteland Two. Uh, I think. And I would agree with the, seems like the general consensus is, is that these are improvements. You know, I didn't see anybody saying otherwise. There's probably some, somebody out there saying that, but, but who cares? I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about this. You know, what was that like behind the scenes? Was it smooth sailing? Were there some aspects that took a lot of discussion and compromising, you know, just in terms of the gameplay mechanics? Nothing in game development is ever smooth sailing. So, so I think this without exception as well. Um, we were definitely balancing and tuning things up up to release, um, for sure. Um, I think in terms of, there's plenty of stuff that had lots and lots of discussion. A lot of stuff that really sparked a ton of discussion 
like that were really controversial were usually things that like we're having a trouble like we get it in and it's working but is it fun mm. is like a you know a big question we constantly have to ask like yes it's working but am i having more fun because of it or not or is it just a cool idea someone had and then and so a lot of that stuff that had a lot of discussion oftentimes didn't really make it into the final product because usually if it has a lot of discussion it's because it's not obviously really nailing it um, and sometimes those lifts are worth it. Sometimes we like, I believe in this feature and I know we can get it there. Um, but sometimes it's, it's like, let's, let's spend our time making the game more fun rather than trying to make this thing be like, you know, sometimes the best you could do is, okay, well, it doesn't make the game less fun, but is that really worth your time? You know, it, it, going unnoticed isn't really, isn't really worth your time. Hmm. Um, I think that's part of, I don't think I answered the full question though. Um, so I think in terms of, in terms of the stuff that worked really well immediately, we very early on knew that we wanted to make sure the player was in control of combat as often as possible, like maximize the time the player is making choices. Um, watching the enemy shoot you is important, but it's not like fun all by itself. Um, you usually want the player to the enemy to shoot you and then put you in a really tricky circumstance. And then the fun part is weaseling your way out of that tricky circumstance. Oh, should I go revive them? Or should I just kind of let them be there and put some more damage on? Should I spend my time doing deployables so I'll distract the fire? Like that's the really fun part. And so definitely moving to the like more traditional turn-based system got us that. And then and then particularly looking at like the, the stuff we did for Bard's Tale on how we tried to work on concurrent enemy movement and um, tried to like speed up player turns carried into this where we were trying to get like all right, well, the player doesn't need to watch every character moving ind individually. That's not interesting. But they do want to see everyone shoot individually so they can, like, track where the damage is going. But any corners we could cut to speed that up, we definitely wanted to take um, to get you back in the driver's seat as soon as possible. Um, and, then, and then from there, I, th I think the core of the combat system is pretty strong and just it's kind of standard, like, chess play. It's just positional, like, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What position should I be in? And how does that compare against the enemy? As that I think was con uh, executed pretty deftly, and it's a simple to understand but really deep system. Um, particularly because, like, what it asks the player to do is to really understand more and more what the enemy is capable of. Yeah, I, I wouldn't add anything to that other than what David said. There was a lot of time spent on making things move quicker, so so that there was the player was in control for a longer period of time, and you weren't sitting there waiting for things to happen. So we did that was a big conversation about moving things along faster without losing tactics. I think you totally nailed that. I mean, that's usually what people complain about turn-based combat is it's too slow. I mean, I got some mm -hmm. examples I usually draw out, but this was like really snappy. No, even like going into combat, you know, Thank you get you. this awesome like. Hello, who, oh, whose idea yeah. was that? That awesome graph paper effect thing. I mean, that. <laughs> as soon as oh. I saw that, I'm like, "Oh, this is going to be great." Yeah, Brian, you got to know. Um, you, you know, it, it's we have some very like, early. Like, like I, I, with my, I don't always remember who came up. It, it could have been me. It could have been somebody else. You know what I mean? Like right, a right. good idea goes out. I'm like, great, love it, let's do it. And I don't always remember who the who the origin is. I remember seeing it and I liked it because I, 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 um, uh, I like that it sold that this is a tactical base mm. game. I mean, when you, when you see a grid comes down, you know what that means. Mm, and so serious, I, I like, I like the messaging that it was giving. And it's going to happen so often. I like that we made it look as cool as, as cool as we did. Cause it's going to happen all the time. So yeah. That's um, and in, in terms of like pacing, thank you, by the way. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I think one of the mantras we stuck with was we found that combat was really fun to initiate. The first one to three turns are usually really intense, but you do, you can get into scenarios if you don't have like ways to reinforce the combat where like the battle is decided, you know, and, I, and the only thing left to do is clean up the enemies. And so we really like tried to also, as we're balancing the combat, you'll find that rangers, one of the reasons we the down system works the way it is, is because we wanted enemies to be really lethal and really dangerous and for you to be afraid of them. And so, and, and it's, I think it, killing player characters causes players to reassess a the strategy. They like, normally I always mark the target and then I have my sniper use precision strike. And that's every combat I do that. But if on turn one, the, you know, your sniper goes down, you know, because enemies are super, super, super lethal, 
now you're like, well, crap, now that thing I've done the past five combats in the row I can't do. And I mm -hmm. think while players like that, the player sees that as like, oh, my guy died. But I think it causes them, the game to be less stale. It causes them to constantly have to kind of re-strategize and think through every scenario fresh because they're never quite sure who's going to be up, who's going to be down, what abilities they're going to use. Um, and, and by really, and as we, in development, as we went, enemies got more and more and more and more dangerous, like progressively more and more dangerous so that we could keep the combats shorter and shorter and shorter to about three turns was like kind of our golden rule. If we could help it like two to four, somewhere in there. Um, so that like the beginning of the battle felt really decisive and then it resolved itself relatively quickly. Once you had that overwhelming advantage, you could kind of kill them off really, really fast, which like precision strikes help with that, for instance. So like I'm in a combat, I kill a bunch of guys, bah, 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 bah. by turn three, my precision strikes up and I can kill that last guy, no muss, no fuss. Yeah, we, we, tried to to, we tried to reduce any kind of slog fest. That was one of the things where like, okay, you, you, you've pretty much won the combat at this point, but no one wants to sit there for five turns working through hit points uh, just because he's got a lot of lot on him. And so, you know, it was those kinds of sort of psychological approaches we take to figure out, you know, what's the fun stuff? <laughs> More of that. What's mm -hmm. the not fun stuff? Less of that. And uh, easier said than done. Uh, and then you kind of work your way through that. I was going to say you guys make it sound so easy, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I played this, you know, like all the way through. I never got to a point where I felt like I'm just going to dominate the battle. Oh, that's good to hear. You know, I always felt like, hmm, and there's always like, oh, now I, I, mean, I did a lot of yelling and screaming at my computer, but but a good kind of yelling and screaming. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find the sting of defeat sweetens victory. Yeah. Like, as a dungeon master, my rule is I want the players to know that I'm willing to kill them. I probably won't, but I need to make sure they know I will. Because that's what, that's what gives your action stakes, and that's what, like, it's what makes your victory not hollow is you like you can imagine a world where you screwed that up and it didn't go right and it was a very plausible world and in our case you probably did screw up three or four times and you kept saves coming if, we, if you got time for one more david i would like I to do you know this thinking a future wasteland game or you know additional content for this one are there things that you would want to change about the combat or the leveling or anything like that there's balance work that's ongoing so like we are very much like I have oh, Reddit alerts on my phone. <laughs> so if a new exploit pops up or somebody complains about some, you know, oh, this gun's OP or, I don't know, this pistol sucks or whatever. Like, I'm kind of watching that and doing a lot of comparative analysis. And, like, um, we're also, you know, we're, we, we send out, like, surveys, and so we're doing user research there. So balance is ongoing. I'm not going to get into a bunch of uh, – uh, I'm not going to give patch notes here um <laughs> yeah but like for instance a to give you an example we found that oh man um players uh, thankfully two things they a lot more players i think are 100 percenting our game than we thought like players really like the game and they're eating up all the content we can give them you know so we di designed the game so you didn't have to do everything um but we're finding a lot of players are and so they were like amassing huge armies of followers which they love and it feels bad to have your followers die. People like will save scum until their followers live. But we were finding that like the enemies were kind of overly distracted by Party Pal and Major Tom and the three cats and the deer and the Russian robot and the like all and the clo everything that you brought along was kind of really causing the AI to like not pressure the player as much as we yeah, wanted. They, they were taking all the bullets. <laughs> all and and but we didn't want to kill Major Tom like every combat like because that also feels bad. That, like, if Major Tom gets one shot by a sniper, you're like, oh, I, that doesn't feel good either. So we've been, like, for instance, like, something we have upcoming is a tweak to the AI so that at the harder difficulties only, the enemy will kind of put more pressure on the player and less pressure on the followers to kind of make the hard difficulties feel properly hard. Because we play tested the game without armies of cats. <laughs> and we know we could beat it. But then we were seeing, you know, a legion of cats roll up and just dominate like our end game Supreme Jerk content. And we're like, oh, oh man, Major Tom, it's you really do cat. outrank me. It's always the cat. <laughs> but it, I, I think I, to put a final pin in it, I think as we are looking forward, we are looking at, we're, we're definitely paying attention to things that people saying, yeah, we love the game, but this one aspect of it isn't very fun. Um, and those are definitely not off the table. 
um, we're, we're looking, I mean, we're, we're looking at the right way to do it because we understand the game is live and people like it. So we don't want to force a bunch of changes on people that they aren't going to be into, but we are looking at like, what other difficulty modes could we add? What little mutators could we add that you could opt into that would kind of fix gripes that people are having so that when they come back for their second or third playthrough, there could be something fresh there for them or it, it addresses a grievance that they had about some certain mechanic that they didn't like. All right. So we have some questions sent in by fans. <laughs> uh, so some of these might be kind of all over the place. But you, we'll just... you say that so with a big smile on your face. <laughs> uh, you never know what's going to happen with these. Uh, so this one's by Tomas. He says, how about a question about a 32-year-old game? Who came up with Killing Bobby in High Pool? I recently replayed Wasteland and appreciated how very little hand-holding there was there. I like learning about the world through quests and environments and not through exposition. So can you please thank him for that, even though probably at the time the team designed the game with whatever tools they had available so that <laughs> some of those things may not have been intentional or have they? Thanks. <laughs> well, let's see. So the, the credit for Bobby and High Pool goes to Liz Danforth. Uh, she was one of the original kind of flying buffalo crowd that, you mm -hmm. know, going back to tunnels and trolls and, I don't know if she was involved with mercenary spies and maybe she did art. I'm not sure, but I know, I know she goes back to that original crowd in, in, in Phoenix and she came up with that. And, and, you know, the great lesson I learned from that um, is that um, that's the first time I worked with a, a different group of writers. You know, there was Marco Green and Mike Stackpole and Ken St. Andre. And then there was the writing that we were doing and I loved the effect of that, you know, because if you go back prior to that, for the most part, and, you know, there's maybe some exception I don't know about, but by and large, a lot of the games that were being done, there'd be, you know, two people on it and certainly not more than one writer. I mean, it's like one person did it. And that taught me the power of bringing different voices in. Like Liz brought a super unique perspective, a woman's perspective, about you know an emotional context with Bobby and the dog, and I liked that, and so I I I, I adapted that you know or adopted that from then on. I mean, Fallout was the same thing. I think that was the the magic of Fallout. It was not that one person did it. it the magic of Fallout was getting all these creative geniuses all working together to create a symbiotic experience, and that's what I try to focus on. So that taught me a lot in that way. Um, as far as, you know, the exposition or, you know, answering the other parts of that question, you know, we just always thought we're going to assume our audience is smart. Uh, even in fact, if you think about the audience back then, like our RPG audience is older now than it was in the 80s. I mean, probably our average audience probably was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, 14 years old, you know, it probably was much younger than it is today, which our average audience is in their 30s and 40s that, that play these games. So they've had more world life experiences, et cetera. But we just treated everybody like they were an adult, whether it was Bard's Tale or Wasteland, we just assumed people were smart. We assumed they'd get the crazy, the, the, the weird jokes, whatever the thing was, we just made that assumption. And, you know, it, it always has served us well. And we'd find that, that you know, some, 14 year old would go through our product and beat it faster than we could beat our own product knowing everything. And so that, that's to me, it all goes back to just assume the audience is smart and you'll probably be fine. Seems like a mantra that's worked out pretty well. <laughs> well, so far. Uh, let's see, here's one from Arjuna and Nat 10 game. So they had a couple of questions to see related. Uh, first one, I, is uh, will Wasteland continue to be turn-based? I hope it will. And then Arjuna just asks, are there any details on new content? <laughs> is there already a demand for new content <laughs> uh, for Wasteland 3? So new content and will it ever be uh, right. not turn-based? So I, I tend to always avoid speculating on anything one way or the other because somebody could be disappointed and then I might not do the thing I speculated on and then re-disappoint. So I, I, I'd rather not even go damned there. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, sort of. Yeah, I will say that we we're, we never are going to lose sight of the hardcore audience that 
you know, that loves this product. And, and there's, there's, there are, there are, you can express it in ways and not ever lose the hardcore and, and do the deep reactivity and the tactical thinking and all that. So again, I wouldn't try to read into my answer because I just, it's, it's just way too early for me to really comment on that. Um, as far as, you know, what would we do or, or are there multiple lines, you know, and, and there, there, there could be multiple yeah. answers to that question. Um, as far as DLC, absolutely. We have plans. Uh, people are, are, are clamoring for it and we love it because there's some things that we wanted to do more of. So there, there'll be some free DLC that we just dropped in, but you know, there, there's going to be, we are working on a couple more areas. There's going to be more poly and more poly lines, you know, better control of the parrots, uh, m more being reminded that the world watched every move you made. Uh, and there's going to be more music and more tough choices and all the stuff that, you know, I think we're pretty clued in on what people really gravitated towards. And we want to dial some of that stuff up. And, but I think, I, I think pets was the biggest thing where, you know, we knew there, the, on one hand, they're like, there's this friction of like, it became a mini game just trying to keep your animals alive. So, uh, mm -hmm. and then there was the, but if I use them for bullet sponges, it makes the game easier. And so, you know, we, we, we want to. That's kind of heartless. We, wow. Yeah, we, <laughs> I know. Well, that's how, that's how they played it, you know. So, um, but if you go get somebody like Polly, we want to add more, more Polly, more personality, not just to Polly, but to the other pets but they can't run into combat and get killed in the first round. Otherwise that we put all that effort in for no reason. So, so we want to play with things like that. So uh, I, I, we had a, a brainstorm session a couple of weeks ago about some of the, you know, the kind of the little moments and things that we were going to do. In it. And I, I absolutely loved it. Everybody is on point uh, when it, in terms of uh, dialing and what, what it is that should be that sort of, representative of the, of the wasteland universe so so yeah it's coming I never have too many rats in a game i, I think we've made fun of that trope pretty well in <laughs> i love that that's probably my favorite part of that game yeah it had to be done all right so here's a question from jeremy and i was learning the same thing myself well troy and brandy ever find love and wasteland for i don't care if troy hates me i still feel like those crazy kids deserve each other <laughs> well all i can say is you know what how well do most high school romances do <laughs> <laughs> well they all get married and live happily ever after don't they uh, is that what happens well does that, that sound like something we do <laughs> no sorry jeremy Let's see, here's one from Richard and Jeff. I'd like to hear about the process of working with Chrome on the Wasteland and Bard's Tale remasters. Ah, uh, well, let's see. Um, they were great to work with. I mean, highly recommended. Uh, that was no easy feat because you, know, you have to remaster those. We don't have the source code. So they got to sort of wow. reverse engineer that stuff in order. So, you know, their hands were tied at a certain level to add things. I mean, there, there were other things where like, wouldn't it be great to do this and that, but then you'd have to remind yourself that we are reverse engineering object code and trying to put things in. So I think the fact that they were able to do such a good job with such, without having those resources is super admirable. So, you know, it was great working with them. And they, and they always made it, even better, you know, I mean, to me, when I work with outside groups, there's some people that do just what you ask for and nothing more. And then some people go a little extra further and that was definitely the case with them. Yeah, I think they did a great job. Yeah. Let's see, here's one from Myco, or Miko, M-I-C-O. Are there any projects that in exile wanted to work on in the past, but could not, but are now a possibility because of being a part of Microsoft? Mm. Um, I mean, if you'd asked me that before we did Kickstarter, I would have said yes. Um, but, you know, Kickstarter and sort of our, 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 our audience has helped us make the kind of things we're making. I think it's more a function of they're going to allow us to do things in the games we wouldn't have been able to do in the past. And I'll give you an example, which is, 
like when they were buying the company, you know, what would you do with the money? I'm like, well, you know, we have, we have fully voice everything. And, and I want to do some things with music that hasn't been done before. And I want to work with, uh, you know, the, this case was a uh, music supervisor for the Tarantino films. And, uh, and so that whole, that whole, the whole thing with the soundtrack was something that wouldn't have happened if we weren't working with Microsoft. So to me, it's going to, uh, allow us to um, hopefully innovate within the genre across any number of different disciplines that we just would have never been able to afford to before. Uh, you know, and, and you know, it's nice. There's so many, now that we're starting a game, a lot of people look at the crowdfunding and think, oh God, they raised $3 million, $4 million. Isn't, you know, that's a huge amount of money. Uh, and really to make games of this size and scope, it's not a lot. Mm -hmm. um you know you, you look at you know larian's probably spending 20 25 million dollars on these things and so the the bar was raising very quickly and we were still i think for what we did with waste time three it was still not a big budget compared to the other products and you know other things like there there there's machine learning and things that can help you with testing but you've got to put that code in ahead of time so that when you get to the end it's going to help you with the whole debug process for example well, it's not like an afterthought you can throw on at the end. You got to plan for those things, but you have to have the money and the resources and the talent and the do all those things. But you only do it if you start the product a certain way. So it's been great with Microsoft because we knew the things we were missing and what we needed. And I've often given the analogy of, you know, we have a band and we're doing good music, but we don't have a bass player. We just don't have one. And yeah, every other band has one, but we don't. So we, we did, we do the best that we can, but now, you know, they're giving us the whole band and, and, and it, it's fantastic. We've hired all this great talent into the company recently and from, from, uh, you know, from art directors to technical directors to lighting experts and 3D modelers and all these disciplines that we kind of got little bits and pieces of. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about the, the new stuff that we're working on. I'm kind of really showing off our chops but what what we won't lose is all the all the tinkering and love the in the in the in the personality that goes into the our products that 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 will remain yeah you had me sold on just the, the music you know that, that was something i loved about this and you know the bard still you know game as well but, but i think with this one i remember that first when that first song where the lyrics kicks in yeah it says i think it's it's a, it's a gospel song right if i'm yeah, washed in the, washed washed in the blood of the lamb. Yeah, yeah, when that song kicks, when that song kicked on, kicked on my like the hair stood up on my arms, you know, and that was just it kind of took it to the, to a next level for me. Uh, just yeah, hearing that, was, that. That was a that was a fun that was an experiment that you know I wanted to try because you know and I, I, I most games in, in our games and you know you, you'd have we have like Mark Morgan does the industrial sound and then you you go into combat and you get the upbeat tempo. <laughs> of that song or something similar there too. And so it you know, builds the tension and then, the, and then the, the combat's over. And I thought, you know, what, let, let's pick a few combats and do something completely different. You know, something that might match the scene that, 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 that sets a mood and, and the film films do it. It's not like movies haven't done this and, and Tarantino films in particular have done that. And I've also always loved the juxtaposition of violence against soft music, which is what, the opening of fallout did right you, you heard the ink spots while the guy was being executed on the ground and people that 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 juxtaposition was was very jarring for people so it's in that same wheelhouse of, of kind of you know philosophy and so but like this was to get to try something completely different and i remember so we you know we, we kicked off the music we had mary go create two or three songs and we said, okay. And, and we had some people on our music side were completely against the idea. This is a horrible idea. Don't what? do it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But Why? that's okay. What? I'm, what possible? I'm used to people <laughs> saying something's a bad idea. So, so I'm like, all right, well, let's just try it out. And so we, we, yeah. we played it. And so, so we, we played a combat and then we just played the up-tempo music just so we go, okay, let's feel that. And then we dropped in, you know, washing the blood of the lambs or God bless America. And it was like, okay, it works. And, and yeah. so it, it felt right. And, uh, and it's been great because the, the audience has, has responded. Like you said, we've gotten 
so many, uh, you know, nice positive reactions on the soundtrack. It's been, it's been great. So that'll, you know, you know that's music. They've done all sorts of studies or, or you know, they'll, they'll use a research labs, you know, what's important to, to the gamers. Okay. And music doesn't make the list. It's just not even a thing. But my attitude is like, why well, they just, they don't know what they're missing. You know, like I'm, we're going to, we're going to lean in anyway. And if you look at our products all the way back to the Bardstell comedy, uh, music was a big part of it. You know, the old beer, beer, beer yeah, song, beer. Deal, right. And, uh, you know, you know, we did music for the Bardstell four with all the, the Gallic singers with this game. Um, uh, and it will be the next one. So that, that, that to me, I, I love that part of, uh, entertainment you know because music's a very it's like it's it can make you stand up and cheer it can make you cry it's a very powerful medium and i think more can be done with experimenting and it can really give life and humanity to a scene like like nothing else can yeah i think it just really took it to to the next level really you know the more i think about it too just uh you know i, I growing up in the south you know we go to the church we heard that song heard that song many many times but like this is a context what's this song doing here? You know, it kind of had a whole new sort of weird new meaning to it. You know, it was really, you know, you know, uh, it's funny. I, so one of my favorite series and not just because of the name is Fargo. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I've loved every season of it. I think the writing is fantastic. Uh, the new one just started. So jury's out on this one, but um, the first scene opens up with washed in the blood of the lamb. They, uh, they have a, uh, they're, they're using that song. So I, Kind of chuckled to myself seeing it also get used in a in, in a weird way yeah it makes you think about the lyrics that you know again you've heard the song or same thing with god bless america you know we, we hear these right. songs over and over but never really listen pay any attention to the lyrics uh, but right. then when you're presented with it in this context then it just kind of does something weird with your brain i don't know <laughs> how else to put it but really uh uh well done stuff uh let's see brad Will Mr. Fargo ever make Mean Time? Been waiting since 1988. <laughs> He's very patient. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, hard to say. Well, I'll say this. They'll, at a minimum, there'll be elements that I'm going to want to use from that design that I will incorporate into other products. Because if there's good ideas, I, I, I tend to store them and I'm patient and look how long it took to get Wasteland done again. Um, so it's not to say it can't happen, uh, but you know, these games take us so long to do, uh, that, you know, how, how many more do we have in, a, in us? You know, there's only so many, so many, uh, that can get done over the next decade or plus or whatever the time is we're working on these things. So, um, that's a scary thought. I know, I know. I went to, I went to a, 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 a GDC. It was like, I don't know. It was ten years over ten, ten years ago, and the and the, and the guy I think it was from somebody from EA I think you know, and and he wasn't and he was doing this to try to do this in a positive way. He's like, statistically speaking, you all everybody in this room will only work on two games again for the rest of your life. <laughs> You're like, whoa, you know. So he was trying to say like, put everything you can into it, but because of how long you're in the industry and how long the games take to make, chances are you're only going to work on two more. And I thought, well, that's. That's kind of sad. Depressing. <laughs> and that was 10 years ago. So for, in my case, he was wrong, thankfully. But, uh, you know, but it did make me think about how long they do take to make. Kind of makes me wonder if you did, if you did know you could only make one more game ever. Oh, boy. What would I, it be? I, I don't know. I, would, I wouldn't say. It, it would, th th then it would be, then why aren't you doing it? You know, so I, uh, I, I can't think in those terms. If if somebody if, it wouldn't if be mean time, though. We... <laughs> I don't think it'd be mean time if that was my last game ever. I don't I don't know what it would be. Demon's Forge two. <laughs> okay. I think people would be disappointed if it wasn't a role playing game. <laughs> Let's see, Matt Bradley Shriggy. Oh, this is a fun question. Are there any games you regret not including in the Interplay 10th anniversary CD-ROM? I actually have that still. I, I, I had to Google to see what was in it. I didn't even remember what was in it. It's a pretty good uh, collection. Well, you know, so I'm not sure 
there's probably something glaring that he's probably thinking about that I don't know. But I think it's important to know that there are products in the um, uh, in the uh, in the mix that we didn't have the rights to. Uh, so Wasteland, Mind Shadow, Task Times, and Tone Town, we had to go cut deals with Activision and Electronic Arts to allow it to be into the compilation. So there could so. I only say it because there's, there's a legal side to what goes into these compilations too. It could have been something that we didn't have the rights to do for some weird contractual reason, or we didn't have the rights or whatever else. So nothing jumps out at me, but, but there probably is something that would have been great that he perhaps is thinking of, but nothing off the top of my head. Yeah. It sounds similar to some of these greatest hits albums, you know, where they have some trouble with, they can't put all the songs on there because some of the songs will be from a different yeah, yes. different, label, different, different label. label. Yeah, right. And so that, that, that's my point. There's often a, a, a backstory mm. to it. That's a good, I'll just mention that in passing. If you, I, I think that's a good collection to, uh, to find because it comes with that thick manual that has like every game. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if you, just, if you want to like just sit down with a big book of uh, manuals. Yeah, that's you're, 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 you're one of the few guys I talked to that has <laughs> been playing them. You know, I, I do some of these, uh, you know, podcasts or whatever and you know and they'll be like i wasn't even born then <laughs> and yeah i'm like yeah 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 i know got it <laughs> yeah think about the kids you had yeah you. my grandfather played that game yeah thanks that's great <laughs> uh flying spaghetti why do you that's the name of the questioner flaying spaghetti i'm sorry flaying spaghetti flaying flaying yeah. how could you confuse that with flying uh, i don't know not even close <laughs> uh, why do you why do you keep switching gaming engines unity wasteland 2 unreal bard 4 then back to unity for wasteland 3 make dev lives simpler <laughs> it's a funny question that they're they, that he cares so much i think that's great um <laughs> the the, the I, let's see the the reason so when we crowdfunded Wasteland 2, you know, we, we assumed our budget was going to be pretty small. Uh, you know, we asked for roughly a million dollars. We figured we'd spend about a million of our own, you know, which would have been about all we had. And then, and then, and then um, you know, roughly $2 million. And then we ended, you know, it ended up being three. But regardless whether it was two or three or four, that again, it's not a big budget. And so we needed to be very clever. How are we going to, because role players expect a certain scope and size for the game. And so how are we going to do that on a, on, a, on a shoestring budget? And the Unity Asset Store was what allowed us to do that. There was a lot, like if we needed a, a 3D model for a, a, a gas station, there it was, $30. You know, you want a desk, $10. And so... Here, we, we could not go out and create all of those things. So it, it was the, it wasn't, it was, we crowdfunded the money, but we also crowdsourced the development in a way. I mean, we, we did the, 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 uh, the local, the, um, the voice work was done on voice funny, but it was a crowdsourced uh, audio. We'd say, we need a person to do this voice and these are the readings and they'd send it out to, 20 people, they'd all do a reading and then we'd pick the winner and that person would be in the thing. You know, we did localization, we crowdsourced. So everything was about getting things done for, you know, uh, the budget that we had. And so, and I remember, you know, uh, Epic, the president of Epic was one of our major backers on Wasteland 2. So, and we had been using Unreal uh, up until then. And so we, we, we close it out, collect the money. And then I don't know how many months later we announced we're going to use Unity. <laughs> he calls me up. He's like, hey, man, what the heck, right? And, oh, I, no. and I said, well, you know, let, let, let me explain. And I said, um, it, we love your engine, but the Unity Asset Store. And they went, ah. And, th and I remember them, them going, yeah, we, we need to do one ourselves. Like that was a... I think a good aha moment for them too in the conversation, which is like, yeah, this, this is a thing. So that's why we ended up with Unity. And then if we're going to do a sequel to Wasteland, you're going to want to use as much code as possible. So you're back on Unity again. Mm -hmm. um, 
<clears throat> but we we did we we have had unreal expertise longer than we've had unity. So so for things like the Mage's Tale uh, and Bard's Tale Four, we were well versed in the engine. And especially if you're doing hallway, you know, crawlers, boy, nothing's better than that. Uh, so it had the graphic fidelity. Um, the you know. I don't know if we'll use Unity again, uh, but but there was a very specific reason why we used it at the time that, that probably most people wouldn't, you know, it's not naturally obvious on its surface. Uh, so I got a couple different people asked some variation of this question. Uh, what's the future like for the barge tail? Uh, what can we expect to see over the next few years in terms of barge tail? You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, we do have people that ask us about that. You know, that, that product was not, was not the success we had hoped it was. It, it was an interesting lesson with that one because we joke that, you know, it'll be on our gravestone that, you know, that was a great game, you know, cause there was the hardcore did not embrace it. Um, and, you know, we streamlined things which sounded good on the surface so it was like, hey, let's not throw them into character creation. Let's let them play for 15 minutes first. You know, so they get an idea of the world, talk to some people. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, man, where's character creation? You know, and it's, well, it's 10 minutes later. What? You know, and then let, let's, let's have you create one person, get, get to know the world, and then do the second, the third, the fourth. Why can't I do the whole party all at one time? You know, and so there was... Uh, frustration that we weren't doing the things that people were used to. And so at its core, super proud of the game. It is a quality product and people who play it absolutely love it. I mm -hmm. mean, it has so much personality and charm, but it missed kind of the play patterns and things that people were used to on the RPG side. So you'd have to really reimagine it. And so, and, and then the other way you could have gone was to like, let's do a sequel that looks like it came out in 1994, right? And I don't think that would have served us well because we would have made a very small audience super happy, but it wasn't, we wanted to be more ambitious, I guess, in certain ways. And, and you know, doing the music and doing the visuals and doing those sorts of things, um, we just, you know, we wanted, you know, bottom line is we wanted to experiment, I think is more, more, more than anything. And so I, it would be an interesting reimagine for what we do. Uh, we, you couldn't take the same approach, but in terms of the, some of the world building that we did, the, the, this with the story and with the characters and certainly the music, and there's some really beautiful scenes. You get into some of those interior dungeons, they're stunning. I mean, they, you, know, I, you really get into some great looking stuff. Um, some of it wasn't, I wish some of it was more front and loaded, but you know, like we didn't want to start you off in a dungeon, which looked great, but you know, story-wise was a little wonky. You know, we tried to get you in a dungeon fairly quickly, uh, you know, but we wanted to set some stuff up. So kind of a long, kind of a long answer to your question, but so I'm just sort of sharing my, yeah, my experience yeah. with the franchise because in case it's of yeah. interest to people in terms of sort of philosophically what we think about it. You know, when we did the, uh, it's interesting. We so we did the uh, the the quote the bar so we call it the AARPG now. You know, the one that came out in two thousand and four. We didn't have the rights to use the copyright, uh, and so we had to make a bar cell without any of the copyrighted material. So so we had to take a completely different tack. And so and again, so that one is like we, let's let's uh, you know let's take a let's spoof a little bit what role playing games have been doing too much. And so the, the audience that first was like, whoa, this isn't what we expected. They were taken aback. But then later, it, it was interesting. It came out and it started to hit formats for which there were no uh, expectations like iOS and Android and even console. All of a sudden, we're getting five-star reviews. I mean, we sold millions of copies. We got the, Google, the Android game of the year. It was like there was a bunch of people that were only taking it at face value and not trying to compare it to everything. Yeah. And they, they just adored it, you know, and, and you see some of the YouTube videos get, you know, for just the beer song, you know, quarter million views and that kind of thing. My point is what's kind of funny is that you've got, then you've got, you've got a crowd of people going, do an up, do, do a sequel to that, 
you know, and then he had another crowd. No, do a sequel to the original, you know, and now now there'll be a do a sequel to the to the to Bard's Tale Four. So sounds like uh, one of those dilemmas you get into funny, the Wasteland it'd be, Four. It'd be a very funny conversation as to what what it would be. <laughs> and just saying, it sounds like one of the dilemmas you'd get into with Wasteland Four. You know, which which you can't make everybody happy. Yeah, indeed, it's true. Yeah, Bard still, I mean, that was one of those, you know, we started off talking about the people that play these games every year. You know, I personally know people that played through that Bard's Tell series, I guess it's probably hundreds of times by this point. Yeah. Let's see, here's a question by Ruby Gold. <laughs> I'd like to see a sequel to Centauri Alliance. <laughs> Is there any that, chance of that? That's definitely not going to happen. I, I I didn't have anything to do with Centauri Alliance, and, yeah. and, I, and I don't even know who owns the rights. So I, I feel pretty confident saying that's not going to happen. Yeah, that was a, a Michael Cranford game. Right. Well, after. Right. Let's see. Here's one. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do a deal with Brotherbun after he left us and did Centauri Alliance. So good, good memory for that person. They, they, win, yeah. they, win, they win the Jeopardy question. <laughs> Let's see. Just a few last ones here. We've got Iago. We kind of already touched on this. Uh, how do you thread the needle of updating an old IP while appeasing the fan base? So I think Iago would be happy with your. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I wouldn't expand too much upon, uh, other than I, I, I hoped I uh, helped articulate the kind of the, the thinking process and kind of the pluses and minuses as we try to, uh, as we try, as we try to look at this stuff. But I think that clearly Wasteland. Wasteland did a great job of threading that needle. You know, Wasteland 2, like one of the things we did with Wasteland 2 is we did that keyword system um, because, you know, sort of, we thought that that was something that, you know, we had the scrolling text, so you could explode them like a blood sausage. And then you had the keywords which people were used to. So we wanted to keep those things. And I think people appreciate it. Once we moved on to number three, we thought, you know, I think people would prefer a real dialogue choice based system at this point. I don't think we should be so married to 1988 that, we, that we'll get a pass on, on, on moving that one forward. And so I think that was a slow step. So like, could we have gone immediately to a dialogue system on Wasteland 2? Maybe, I don't know, but, but, or, but, or were we good? Was it good that we took that interim step, you know? And so again, those are the sort of the things we think about because we, we, we don't, we want the fans to like what we're doing, but we also at the same time have to recognize that the game design and game UIs have changed quite a bit for the, over that period of time. So you can't ignore it because like, we play games ourselves. I mean, there are things that we enjoy in games that if, you know, if you were to make me do it exactly like I did in the eighties, early nineties, I would be frustrated. And so, you know, that, that's that and that's kind of the, the, the art of trying to find those the right, uh, you know, touchstones. Let's see. Andre, are you going to make a director's cut uh, torment Tides of Numenera? And a new I think, set in the I, same think I think I, all of my all my games I'd have left in me would be done up just by the, all these requests on the, on the last <laughs> one. Uh, no, I mean, that, that, that you know, Those you know director's cuts things, are popular though, aren't they? You know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is on, it depends on the product, but sometimes when you finish a game, you have people that were integral, that did it, that move on to other jobs. And so it can often be difficult to, uh, to, to do things even when you want to. That's not really not why we're not doing this right now, but it's just sort of a reaction sometimes when people, it, it's, it's often easier said than done uh, to, you know, fully address things. That's why, you know, we, we're, we're working, we're going to get everything dialed in perfect, you know, but at some point, like some period of time from now, if they said, hey, do something with Waste on 3, it would it's a lot, it's easy to do now. It would be really hard to do two years from now, unless you were dropping updates, you know, all uh -huh. the way throughout. But like, the, the, you know, the whole, in, whole engines change, like they'll update the, the Unity engine. Like I, I, bet, I bet just to change to update the Unity engine, to use the new <laughs> Unity engine, would, it would cost us a half a million dollars just on that alone before you even wow. added a, a single thing. So there's a lot of hidden things that are difficult. It's the same thing, you know, one of, like when 
I sympathize with anybody who, who misses their dates or anything else, you know, like with uh, Unity, up in, if they update their engine, we have to update. And so let's say they do it three weeks before you launch, you've just lost two weeks updating to the new engine. It's just because it broke things. And then, and then you'll get down to the heart. The console manufacturers might say, like we had a, we had a thing where, with Sony where they, they, want, they were updating the engine for the new hardware. Did you ha if you didn't get your product through CERT, then you had to upgrade to another version of Unity. And if we had not gotten through CERT at that time, then we wouldn't adopt Waste Sun 3 out on Sony uh, at the same time because we would have missed that cutoff date because we didn't make it through mm -hmm. CERT because of the, like I said, the time spending on those things. So there's all this crazy like stuff, some things that are not under your control in development uh, that we just sort of dig, deal with with these sort of fires that go on. So you always, you, I, when I read online about you, know, why is something late or whatever? And I think, yeah, <laughs> people had any idea, you know, kind of the drama that goes on behind the scenes uh, for getting these things out the door. So. Again, not, not exactly answering the question totally, but I like just sharing, you know, different yeah, aspects I didn't, of the job. I didn't realize how intense it was when those new Unity versions come out. It, it sounds like you might almost get into a situation where you can't keep up. Like by the time you fixed all the bugs that were caused by the previous patch, you know, here comes a new one. It, it, they, it, things change, you know, things change, things break, you know. I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff happens, but... All right, two last questions, Brian, if you got the time. Sure. Can sure. we do these? Two? Yep, yep. Uh, so this is from, let me just read the question. How amazing is it working with Chris Bischoff? How amazing is it to work with Chris Bischoff? I so hear I'm he is a devilishly handsome and a swell guy. <laughs> You'll never guess who sent this one in. Yeah, let me guess. It was either Chris <laughs> or his brother, but it's probably Chris that asked that question. Yeah, I, uh, I, no, I love the work those guys do. Um, when we kicked off, uh, um, some people may remember that they uh, did sort of a reimagining of what Fallout 4 would have looked like if it was isometric. And they did some isometric shots that were beautiful. And they did that, well, I think they did it with Bioshock also, if I remember. And I, I had already liked the work with them in the past, and I love their, I love their, especially their lighting, their attention to lighting. They're very good at that. So when we did the early prototyping for Wasteland 3, I brought them on and said, let, let do, let's do your magic again. Help us imagine what it could look like. What I like to do is bring in people and do something that's like, how are we going to get to that bar? You know, or what's your approach? And so I'll, I'll bring in people like that. So yeah, I, I have a lot of time for those guys. They're, 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 they're cool guys. And then our last question here from Trent Oster. Maybe I shouldn't have given his name out. <laughs> Were you angry at Trent for handling your tricorder? Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. I had no idea what the context of this was. That goes back to uh, he. So, gosh, that's so long ago. In our, in our old uh, Interplay building, I had one of the tricorders from the sets. You know, for an oh, actual wow. Star Trek, you know, real, cause remember the I did all the, all the Star Trek games. And oh, yeah. so, so 25th anniversary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And judgment rights and all that yeah. stuff. And, uh, I don't, I'm only vaguely remembering this. I think he has a better memory than I do. So I, I might be off, but I think he must be, he must have probably been fooling around with it and doing screwing around with it, not realizing, you know, what it was. And so I may, maybe I would, Hey, that's the real thing. <laughs> Got embarrassed. Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he's talking about, but it's it's probably something along those. I remember him playing around with it, but that's all I remember. <laughs> all right. Well, well, thanks a lot, Brian. This has been fun. Yeah. Well, congratulations again on the game. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good luck that's on your good. future project. <laughs> it's, it's, it's two, nice... two, you got two more projects, I guess. Well, that, well, well, you know, maybe. Who knows? Let's see what that number is. <laughs> Well, anyway, yeah, no, I, 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 I enjoy doing your shows, Matt. I appreciate your, uh, you know, you're like the real guy, you know, you've been around a long time and you're, you're always very positive and up on the category. And so, you know, I always have a lot of time for you. Oh, thanks so much. Cool. So, all right.
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should have a new episode coming up pretty soon. I've got uh, Chris uh, uh, Bischoff on the line, amongst other people who are expressed some interest in coming on the show. It might be a while. You know, I'm totally <laughs> just completely swamped here in uh, St. Cloud, as you could imagine, uh, being a professor and all. But hopefully I will find some time to get some more episodes out to you soon. And as always, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show. You're keeping these episodes coming. Believe me, guys, I could not do this. I would not do this uh, without your support. So I really, really appreciate that. You know, I'm just going to say, I know uh, I've been, you know, look at the exit surveys on Patreon. Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it really, you know, it's sad to see. Uh, so many folks losing their jobs, uh, basically being unable to even pay their bills. And, you know, believe me, folks, if you're in that situation, please don't be sending money to me. You know, you know, focus on your family and yourself first, of course. Uh, you know, I completely understand that. Uh, I've been trying to keep these episodes going even, you know, through all the tumult. You know, it can be difficult at times, but I feel like, you know, uh, I want to continue on. I think it in my own little way, maybe brighten some days uh, in these bleak times. But, you know, I say all that just to say, you know, if you've had to withdraw your support lately uh, because, uh, you know, you're just unable to pay for it, I understand that. Don't feel bad about it. Uh, on the other hand, though, if you are in a position where you're working from home, everything is fine, everything is cool, and maybe you're even making some money, making some extra money, you know, somehow, uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, this might be a good time if you haven't stepped up to the plate yet this would be an ideal time to come on uh, become a patron or a ratcheron of the show really appreciate that and i think you get more out of the show if you're financially supporting it so uh, again if you're in if you're cool and everything is groovy you know go on uh go on to that patreon site kick in a buck maybe two bucks you know to cover for somebody else who's who's had to uh, step down uh, on the other hand if you're unable to do that completely understand and i still hope you enjoy the show uh, and don't forget, too, guys, if you want to support the show, there's other ways, you know, if you can't afford to, you know, it doesn't cost anything to to retweet an episode or, to, you know, to, even to give it a thumbs up on YouTube or to tell somebody about it. You know, all that doesn't cost anything, uh, and it can really lead to some good results, uh, too. So whatever you do to support the show, I appreciate it. I just want you to know that I am grateful to you. All right, let's see. What about that news from the Mac Cave? All right, so I sent Matt Wer Workala to work. <laughs> uh, you know, these guys, we have a little uh, uh, Facebook group where we share news and a Facebook page as well called Matt Chat and a Discord page and a Twitter feed. So a lot of, uh, I get a lot of news from all over the places, all over the place. I try to keep it all straight. Uh, but let's see, Matt sent this in about Mike Morheim. This is the co-founder of Blizzard Entertainment. Well, you know, a little indie game studio. Uh, anyway, they've uh, launched a studio called Dreamhaven, and I was reading about this. It gets kind of involved. Basically, they're opening up all these different studios and, I guess, footing the bill. And let, let, let these folks just uh, come up with proposals, I suppose, and see what they come up with without having to feel uh, really pressured to rush something out the door. Uh, basically, uh, skunk works, you know, sounds like to me. You know, do what you want, guys, and, you know, we'll just kind of stay out of it, I guess, provide some uh, some resources to you. We'll see what happens. A think tank, I suppose. Uh, it's an interesting approach. Could lead to some good things. You know, we'll, uh, we'll see uh, what happens with this. Looks like they've got two studios so far, one called uh, Moonshot and the other one called Secret Door. So we don't really know, I guess, much more than that at this point, but maybe something to keep an eye on. You know, it's a lot of talent there, a lot of creativity, and a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, some good things could happen. Uh, Matt also wrote in about this, and I think this is just incredible. I mean, this really is just something else. It's, do you remember a game called, it's, it's got a couple different names, Another World, Out of This World, you know, one of those is European, I guess, and one was for America. 
I'm pretty sure it was out of this world on my my uh, uh, <laughs> Commodore <laughs> on uh, my computer. Uh, but somebody has decided they want to port this to the Commodore 64. And uh, Matt sent me this article from the Indie Retro News. So just take a look at this. It's a pat platformer classic. I guess kind of an adventure game. It's a cult classic from 1991. Yes, it was. Uh, says here it was on the Amiga 500. I must have had it on, a, you know, I had an Amiga 1000. I don't remember. You know, I guess it must have been my Amiga I played this on. Had to have been. <laughs> I'm getting older, guys. You know, my memory is not what it used to be already. Uh, but anyway, take a look at this C64 port. This is Eric, oh, let's see, Mijakirik. Mijakirik uh, has done this. And I, I'm actually kind of intrigued by this. You know, not so much that it looks like the original, but it just kind of looks, uh, you know, to, to quote the title, out of this world. <laughs> it's really kind of surreal looking. It's just kind of bizarre and strange in a, in a cool kind of way. I mean, really, take a look at this uh, trailer. You know, I'm really excited about this. I don't know what's going to happen when this will eventually be released, but it really looks extraordinary. Uh, take a look, and that is on Indie Retro Games. And then finally, we've got a Microsoft Flight Simulator. They're doing this VR closed beta. You know, talking about VR. I know a lot of you guys are into the uh, flight sims. Super realistic, super immersive. And this appears to be the next level of this. Uh, Microsoft Fl uh, Flight Simulator team looking for dedicated Microsoft Flight Simulator community members to help them with this uh, VR build. So they got a few requirements. Of course, you had to have the game. You had to have the VR equipment. But you could uh, actually sign up and be part of this uh, project. And it looks pretty damn uh, cool to me, you know, especially if you are into flight sims and VR. I think you'd want to uh, pay attention to this. Uh, so good luck, uh, good luck, guys. I'll post the link there. You can sign up, see if they will accept you uh, on their team. But I think it's a pretty cool opportunity. So anyway, thank you, uh, Matt, for all that news. I could not do it without uh, Matt Workula. All right. Uh, also, Matt Bradley, Shergi, and Alan, and uh, yeah. did you change anything? Probably. You know, as I say, I just want to say a general thanks to everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a grateful guy. I don't, I don't ever claim to be doing all this by myself. I, I try to spread the credit because uh, this is a team effort here at Matchet. All right, uh, how about the quote? And uh, I, I did find a quote. <laughs> I did find my own quote. I was looking for quotes about sort of disaster and coping with, uh, you know, hard times, surviving a crisis, that sort of thing. And I found this quote that I thought was especially relevant for this episode. It's by an American novelist named Julia Glass. And her quote, I think, is fantastic. And it goes something like this. All the best novels are about one thing, how we go on. The characters must survive the fallout of their own cowardice, folly, denial, or misguided passion. They squander what matters most, and still they pick up the pieces. So ponder on that, and see you guys next time. Rock and roll out!